You are watching the official worship cast of Journey of Life Church in Orlando, Florida. Visit us on the internet at journeyoflife.org. celebration prepared for you, and I would like you to relax, enjoy yourself, enjoy the music, enjoy reliving the story of Christmas, and maybe, maybe in a new way, maybe in a brand new way tonight, this story that we've been telling ourselves for 2,000 years will come alive for you. Let's take a moment and pray as we begin. Father in heaven, we are thankful to be here tonight. Tonight we celebrate the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom the angel said is a Savior, Christ the Lord. Father, teach us what that is. Open our hearts and minds to see in a new way what this baby born 2,000 years ago brings to our life. We ask that in Jesus' name. Yes, yes. 
swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, 
Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. that you really like? Anybody? A present you got is just memorable. It doesn't have to be like your favorite. A memorable present. What? Pokemon card box? Excellent. Anybody else? A memorable present. It, grown-ups too. Come on, you guys get memorable presents. I'm sorry? I can't hear you, sorry. Yeah, excellent. Two Japanese dolls from Seiko. Two Japanese dolls. That's cool. One more. A memorable present. Anybody? Nobody? Okay. My sister gave me uh, fluffy bedroom slippers with little sheet faces on them. All right. Fluffy bedroom slippers with sheet faces. That's memorable. You can, you can use those about eight nights a year. <laughs> All right. Who likes to give presents? Who likes to give presents? Okay, a couple people. What's like one of the favorite things you've ever been able to give somebody else? Something you... Okay, I'll, I'll start. I remember when I had my first job, me, I actually got to give my parents a CD player 
it was right when they were brand new, and I was so thrilled that I could actually give them something that wasn't made with macaroni and spray painted gold. <laughs> so, but those are cool too, right? I mean, now that I'm a parent, I know. What's something you really liked to give? Anybody have a present they gave and they were just really liked it? Yeah, yeah. Um, years ago, we were caroling, and we went to a, a woman's house, and she was eating her home with her stove. And we bought a heater and, and sent it to her oh. anonymously. And I just stopped it really did you guys hear that? They were caroling, and they caroled at a lady's house who was heating her home with her stove because her heater was broken. So they bought a heater anonymously and sell a space heater anonymously so she could do that. Anybody else? What, anybody else have a present they gave that they really like? Liked giving? Yeah. So giving soap to your dad. Actually, your dad liked the soap too. Okay, one more. Two homemade fluffy snowmen made out of old socks. Two snowmen made, made out, out of old, old socks, buttons, and... But washed. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and stuffing. And stuffing. Excellent. Okay, last one. Does, is anybody here the kind who likes to really, like, do it up a little bit with presents? Like, you, most people know somebody. There's a few people who love to, like, they make a scavenger hunt out of it. Or they have a riddle, and you have to go find the present. Anybody in here like to do that? Once in a while? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. All right, so my grandfather liked to do that. And <clears throat> one time, I can't remember if it was my birthday or Christmas, but he, I, and I'm not sure whether I asked for a tennis racket or not, but I kind of figured it was a tennis racket, and I, the box was, you know, yay big or whatever. And I opened up the box, and sure enough, there it was, right in the case, Wilson, tennis racket. And I pulled off the case, and it was this battered old, like, almost like he had taken one of his old tennis rackets and smashed it on the ground. And so now I knew the jig is up, right? There's a game somewhere, because my grandfather was always the one. You had to check the cards, because he might have taped something in the card or whatever. So looking all around, I'm, he's smiling at me, and I'm waiting to see. Uh, waiting for him. Is he going to pull it out by the couch? Do I have to go find it? And finally, finally I figured out he had actually cut a false bottom in the box for the tennis racket and stuck the actual tennis racket in the bottom of the box beneath it. But he just he just loved, he loved to, to, um, to, to do that whole big thing with the presents. And so today we're talking about presents and gifts and <laughs> surprises that go with gifts. And Christmas, Christmas is a little bit like that my grandfather's gift, where there's a surprise inside this baby. We, we have, some, all of us, have, most of us anyways, have celebrated Christmas for most of our lives. We go to services, we decorate our houses, we sing songs about it, so it's a big deal and it's wonderful, but that's, we have to, if we want to really get the surprise of Christmas, we have to step away from 2,000 years of celebration to think about the original Christmas, and then we'll kind of get a sense more of the surprise of Christmas. So what we need to do right now is we need to take you back and see if you can kind of get yourself into where a baby is lying in a manger. How many of you have ever been to Green Meadow Farms? Anybody? Okay. How many of you have driven through cow country? All right. So kind of let yourself go back there, okay? You can hear. Can you hear the, the sounds? There's a baby, and he's like maybe crying or maybe not. The song says no crying he makes, but I don't know about that. But so there's like, you can hear cow, right? You can hear chickens. And, and you can, uh, you know, maybe there's a donkey or something. And then, and then it's, and then you can smell it. Go back to Green Meadow Farms or when you're driving through cow country or whatever. Ah, it's the smell. Okay, so there we are. We're in a little stable and there may be a few people there because Mary might have had help. You know, she, she's a new mother. People are going to come around to help her. And so there's like the animal noises and the smells, 
And there's a brand new baby lying in a manger. A couple of oil lamps kept way away from the hay, of course, because that could be dangerous. And that's where Jesus is born. That's, and and we, gotta, we have to go back there in order to get the surprise nature of the birth of Christ. And the, the surprise nature, it, it, kind of, it kind of builds. Even in the New Testament, it builds. There's four Gospels, four different stories about the life of Jesus. Four different people wrote accounts of the life of Jesus. And each of them gives us a little different picture. Mark is the first one to write an account. Mark was probably like a young man, like a 13, 15-year-old guy. And he got to hang with Jesus. He wasn't one of the disciples. But he was the first one who actually wrote down an account. And his account starts like this. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then it goes straight to Jesus' baptism and ministry. He's got no childhood. Because in Mark's mind, Jesus' childhood doesn't matter at all. Because it's what he did. He was born. He lived. He taught. He died on the cross. And he rose again. And that's what matters. Then you get the next two gospels. And there's one by a guy named Matthew. Matthew was a Jewish tax collector. So what Matthew concentrates on is Jesus as the fulfiller of Jewish prophecy. So he has things like, he's got a nice long genealogy in there to show that Jesus was born in the right place at the right time, according to all the prophecies. And then you get Luke is the other guy in the middle. And Luke is a doctor, Greek. And Luke has, basically here's the way Luke's gospel starts out. There's a lot of stories floating around about Jesus. So I thought it would be really good to sit down and write an orderly and well-researched account. So by the way, if that, if that kind of thinking attracts you, then Luke is your gospel. Go read Luke, because he's a doctor, and he sat down to write an orderly and well-researched account. Luke is the one we read tonight. Luke is the one, he must have gone to talk to Mary. And he must have interviewed Mary and said, tell me everything. Tell me, tell me like about Jesus' birth. And remember, at the end, it says Mary treasured up all these things in her heart. Maybe, maybe she hadn't told anybody. Maybe she said, well, I never told anybody this. But this is what happened. And then she told me what happened. And that's what we read all the time, every Christmas. Then we get to John. And John is the last gospel written. John has already read. He, he knows that he was a disciple of Jesus. who so traveled with Jesus. He's an older man. All those other stories about Jesus are floating around. And John's trying to figure out <clears throat> what to write that's different. What's going to tell people what they really need to know about Jesus. And he starts like this. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God in the beginning. And that is pretty convoluted. It kind of makes your head spin. But I'm going to tell you what it means. Word is a Greek, a philosophical word. It's a, it's a philosophical word that basically means the essence of something. And it's kind of weird to say, in the beginning was the essence of God, and the essence of God was God, and the essence of God was with God in the beginning, and that would truly not make sense, and truly we would say, why in the world did he write that if it weren't for a few verses later when he wrote those famous words that so many people have heard, the word became flesh. The essence of who God is became flesh. Something amazing happened in the, so in the the thing going on in this little stable is it's like bigger on the inside than the outside. There's a thing called the TARDIS. Anybody heard of the TARDIS? I'm going to show you the TARDIS. It's from Doctor Who. If this works. I've had a lot of technical problems. So Watch what you're, what you're going to see is a blue police call box. It looks like a red phone booth, only it's for the police. And then watch, watch the spatial characteristics of the TARDIS.
I don't know if you caught that, but that was a, on the outside, it's a police box. And on the inside, it's a huge spaceship. Because it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. And I think that's a great picture of what's going on in Bethlehem. I think what's going on in Bethlehem is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside because it's the word. It's, it's the essence of who God is taking on human flesh. And this becomes a big deal for us. And it's, it's a surprising thing because not only does John and all the other disciples assert that in, in a miraculous way this is God become flesh, but what becomes apparent is this whole thing is orchestrated. It's put together this way on purpose. It's been planned this way for millennia to happen. The prophets have talked about it. And here's the thing. When something is orchestrated, you don't just learn about the thing. You learn about the orchestrator, don't you? When I told you about my grandfather and the, the tennis racket and, and uh, hiding it in a false spot, Maryland, you learn about my grandfather as well as about the present he gave me. And so when we look at the circumstances here, we're not just learning about a baby. We are learning about God. We are learning about the universe in its core. We are learning about how things are supposed to be. We are learning about how the Creator views the creation. And what do we see? For the King of the universe being born, what do we see? He's born to an unwed mother. That's not exactly how a king should be born, I would think. Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, is five miles away from Bethlehem, and yet the King of the universe is born in Bethlehem. In a little town, instead of up in the big town in the capital. Jesus is born, by choice, in a stable, and put in a manger. Kings are supposed to be born in palaces. When, kings, when new kings are born, the announcement goes out to all the dignitaries. And who gets the heavenly announcement? Who gets the honor of an angelic visit to tell of the, the king who was just born? Shepherds. Oh my gosh. Shepherds. They're lower than Uber drivers. <laughs> Man. Shepherds. And they were not only shepherds, they were night shepherds. So what is this? This is telling us, I mean, this is a nice story and all for sure, but it's telling us about God. It's telling us about God and the way God looks at the world and the way God looks at us. And so all of a sudden, if Jesus is the essence of who God is and the whole thing is orchestrated and it's orchestrated into a place of poverty and it's orchestrated into a place of powerlessness and it's orchestrated to be announced to the lowest of the low on the socioeconomic ladder... Are we finding something out about God? Are we finding something out about the way the universe is put together? I think we are, and what we're finding out is the earth is broken. Because if you did it like it's supposed to be done, he'd born in, be born in a palace with an announcement to the dignitaries, in a place of power. But no, that's not where Jesus is born. And so we learn that God stands by the powerless. We learn that God stands by the poor. We learn that God stands by the people in the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. Jesus turns the whole thing upside down. That's the surprise of Christmas. That, that's God's gift to the world. And G Jesus is God's gift to the world. And he comes in and he shows us that we don't, in fact, make God in our image because if we did, we would construct a big, powerful, mighty God, probably a God who's always on our side, who does what we want and kicks our enemies' buttons. 
and provides us for what we want. But what we find when God reveals himself in Jesus Christ is that God comes alongside the lowly and stands with them. Jesus is God's gift to the world. I want to give you three ways real quick. Real quick. The first, and these are all surprising. These are all part of the surprise of Jesus being God's gift to the world. The first one is that God is not the one who lays burdens on us. God wants to be the one to lift burdens from us. Come to me, Jesus said, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, he said, because my burden is easy and light, and you will find rest for your souls. Who wants rest for your soul? That's what Jesus brings. That's Jesus as God's gift to the world. Rest. The one people that Jesus really got on their back was the religious leaders who told people you had to do this and this and this and this and this to make God happy with you and to earn his blessing. And Jesus says, no, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. You will find rest for your soul. So God is not the placer of burdens. God is the remover of birds. Second thing we, we automatically think about God is that he's like a big record keeper in the sky. We're wondering if he's keeping track of what we've done and what we thought and, and this and that. But God is not the great record people, keeper. <clears throat> God is the forgiver. How many of you know John 3.16? Anybody? Yes, how many of you do? A lot of you do. And you might know it even if you don't know it. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 17 is the verse where Jesus actually says why he came into the world. And you need to hear this. You need to hear this tonight because it's part of the surprise of the the danger. It's part of God's gift to the world. Jesus said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved. He did not send Jesus to condemn. How many of you have a condemning voice in your head that you think is the voice of God calling down on you and bringing that condemnation for what you've done or what you've said or what you've like not lived up to. Jesus did not come into the world to be the condemning voice in your head. He came to lift your burdens and bring peace. And the third thing is that God is not the distant creator. He hasn't just like... This is part of the gift of Jesus, how Jesus is God's gift to the world. God is the intimate lover of your soul. The intimate lover of your soul. Anyone know the book of Song of Solomon? Anybody ever heard the book of Song of Solomon? It says nothing about God. It's a poem about one lover chasing another lover through the streets and describing how beautiful she is. Why do you think that's in the Bible? It's because that's the way God thinks of you. God is not the distant creator. He is the lover of our soul. Now, here's a question for you. So Jesus is God's gift to the world. And he brings to us lightness. He wants to lift our burdens. He doesn't bring condemnation. He brings salvation. He brings peace. Where is he now? Where is God's gift to the world now? I can tell you exactly where to find God's gift to the world right now. God's gift to the world is sitting in your seat. God's gift to the world is sitting in your seat. It's you. That's what the Bible tells us. That's what happens when Jesus comes and then we say, wow, and we start to believe what Jesus shows us about God Jesus is God's gift to the world. And then Jesus says, now you are God's gift to the world. Check it out. I'm not lying. Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come where? Come to him and make our home with him. In that day, Jesus said, the day when when you kind of finally start to get it all. 
In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. If Jesus is God's gift to the world, and Jesus is in you, who are you? You are God's gift to the world, too. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, manger, donkeys, gift to the world, lover of people's souls, lifter of burdens, remover of condemnation. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. You are God's gift to the world, if you will accept it. You are God's gift to the world. What does that do for how you see yourself? What does that do for what you think about yourself when you walk out the front door in the morning, or when you walk into the store, or when you go to work? You are, in fact, God's gift to the world. Paul said the same thing. Look, we are... God's workmanship. He made us. Created in Christ Jesus, the Savior, the original gift of the world. For what? Good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's your life purpose right there. You are God's gift to the world. Who am I? As a matter of fact, I am God's gift to the world. And you can say that because it's true. Not in the proud way, obviously. But in the service way. Who am I? What's my life about? What's my purpose? What am I doing here? You are here to be God's gift to the world in the likeness of Jesus who lives in you. The Christ. The Spirit of Christ that lives in with you. Within you. And so you bring Christ to the world as God's gift. I'm going to give you two things and we're going to kind of be done here. The first thing you bring is acceptance. How many of you have been around people who you don't feel very accepted? I have. How many of you have been around people where you just really feel accepted by them? You just, you sort of, ah, right? That's one of the ways that you are God's gift to the world, when you bring that kind of acceptance to other people. What an amazing gift. That's what Paul tells the Romans. He says, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you. So there's one way you can start today to live out what we know to be true, that you are God's gift to the world. Here's the other one. Just like Jesus is not a record keeper, he's a forgiver and a lifter of burdens, you follow Jesus in treating people that way, and you become the God's gift to the world. Be kind to one another, Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave. You see, it flows out of Jesus. He's like the gift to the world. He is God's gift to the world. But he comes to live in you. He walks with you. He guides you. And in Jesus, you become God's gift to the world. What does that look like for you? I wonder. How exciting how exciting to think of your life like that. You are God's gift to the world. I love gifts. I love gifts. Christmas is about Jesus, of course, being God's gift to the world. Bringing forgiveness, love, new life, hope, peace, lifting burdens, rest for our souls. That's fantastic. And we receive that. That's what's at the core of the universe. That's the logos of the universe. It's not power. It's not authority. It's love. In all the ways we live that out. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or rude or self seeking And all that. And now, because you've heard about Jesus as God's gift to the world, you are God's gift to the world. How exciting is that? How exciting is that? I wonder what your life is going to look like tomorrow. You're going to wake up and open gifts, and of course you're probably not going to run into any strangers tomorrow because it's a holiday, but the next day. Okay, let's go to the 26th, Boxing Day. I wonder what it looks like then. If you wake up in the morning and you think, here I am. I have a day filled with good works which God prepared beforehand for me to walk in. I'm waking up as God's gift to the world. I'm walking out my front door as God's gift to the world. I'm going to the store. 
How can I give love, acceptance, peace, and joy to the people around me? How exciting. I wonder what that looks like for you. I just wonder, because we all have such different lives. Let's just take a moment and have a little a prayer, to, to just kind of pray through that. Father in heaven, <clears throat> well, first we want to thank you for Jesus, that long prepared gift, the ultimate gift, the gift that brings new life, the gift that erases our sin, the gift that gives us rest for our souls, the gift that shows us what the universe and you are really like, which shows us how messed up this world really is. Help us to latch on to Jesus. Help us to look at Jesus and say, that's the guy I want to follow, because if he shows us how you really are and how the universe is intended to be, that's pretty awesome. And then as we latch on to Jesus, help that transform our own sense of ourself and our identity. Help us begin to walk through each day with a greater awareness that God actually wants to use us. Yeah. Yeah. To bring his gifts of life and peace and joy and burden lifting and rest for souls. He wants to use us to be his gift to the world. To bring that into other people's lives. Father, let this Christmas do that to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue as we sing Silent Night. So 
And now we're going to celebrate the meal Jesus gave us. The meal he gave to his followers before he was crucified. On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he passed it to his disciples and said, drink of this, all of you. This cup is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Just a couple of quick logistical things. We don't, uh, we don't have ushers. We just kind of go row by row. And then also, we don't, uh, we don't, you don't have to be like a member to take communion or anything like that. We believe that this is a meal that Jesus gave us for people who are willing to hear his call. Who want to say, Jesus is pretty cool and I'd like to be part of that. And so anybody who wants to take communion tonight, who wants to be part of Jesus, who wants to be part of being a burden lifter, being a forgiver, being a lover of other people. This is a meal for you, a meal that draws us together as one humanity under Christ, whose birth we celebrate tonight. So if you would like to take communion tonight, you are welcome. We're glad to have you with us. Let's take a moment and pray. Father in heaven, you have brought us to this moment, the baby born in Bethlehem. But we know the whole story, though he lived and that he died on the cross. And that he rose again on the third day. That we celebrate every Easter. And so, Father, help us to see your gift to the world in Jesus. And then help us to embrace the Jesus life. Help us to believe that Christ lives in us. So that we can participate in your redeeming in the world, in your burden lifting in the world, in your forgiving in the world, in your loving of the world. And bless us as we celebrate this meal that Jesus followers have been celebrating for 2,000 years. In his name, amen. Brian will be here with Here's the way it'll work. Brian will be here with the bread, and then you can approach the altar, and either you can dip your bread in the stoneware cup in the middle of the altar, or if you prefer to take a sip, uh, you can take a sip from one of the gold-colored cups on either corner of the altar.
Let's take one moment to pray and we'll sing our closing song. Father in heaven, you have uh, brought us here. You have <clears throat> reminded us of your gift to the world in Jesus Christ. Of burdens lifted, of peace given, of forgiveness, of new life. And you've reminded us of purpose. That in Christ, we too become your gift to the world. Help us to at least begin believing that about ourselves so we can own that and begin to let that light of life percolate inside of us so that it could grow and that we can truly be your gift to the world as we move through our lives. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Help us to follow him.
We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to sing our closing song. We've got to Back there on the table, 
And so please hang around for a few minutes to celebrate Christmas with us. And I'll leave you with these words. May God the Father, giver of all good gifts, fill you with Christmas joy this evening and always. Amen. Amen.